from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium 2019, brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Welcome back to MIT, everybody. You're watching The Cube, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante. I'm here with Paul Gillen, my co-host Tom Davenport is here. He's the President's Distinguished Professor at Babson College, Cube alum. Good to see you again, Tom. Thanks for coming on. Glad to be here. So yeah, this is, uh, let's see, the 13th annual MIT CDOIQ. It's um, unlucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure has well, this year. Our seventh, I think. So really? maybe we'll offset that, <laughs> you know. So, you gave a talk earlier. Um, should we be afraid of the machines or should we embrace them? Uh, I think we should embrace them because so far they are not capable of replacing us. Um, I mean, you know, when we hit the singularity, which I, I'm not sure will ever happen, but it's certainly not going to happen anytime soon, uh, we'll have a different answer. But now, good at small, narrow tasks, not so good at doing a lot of the things that we do. So I think we're fine, although, as I said in my talk, I have some survey data suggesting that large um, US corporations, their senior executives, a substantial number of them, more than half, would like to automate as many jobs as possible, they say. So, that's a little scary. But uh, fortunately for us, humans, I think it's going to be a while before they succeed. Well, now, we had a case last year where McDonald's employees were agitating for an increase in the minimum wage, and uh, the management used the threat of, ro of roboticizing the hamburger making process, which is, can be done, right. uh, to, to uh, uh, get them to back down. Or, or do you think we're going to see more of more of that where maybe AI is used as a threat? Well, I haven't heard too many other examples. I think for those highly structured, um, you know, relatively low level tasks, it's quite possible, particularly if, if we do end up raising the minimum wage beyond a point where it's economical to, to pay humans to do the work. Um, but I would like to think that you know, if we gave humans the opportunity, they could do more than they're doing now in many cases. And one of the things I was saying is that I think companies are generally, there's some exceptions, but most companies are not starting to retrain their workers. Amazon recently announced they're going to spend 700 million to retrain their workers to do things that AI and robots can't. But that's pretty rare. Certainly that level of commitment is very rare. So I think it's time for companies to start stepping up and saying, how can we develop a better combination of humans and machines? Well, the work by you know, Brynjolfsson and McAfee, which is a little dated now, but it definitely suggests that, that there's some, some things to be concerned about. Of course, ultimately their prescription was an, one of an optimist and education and, yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and, and so forth. But you know, the key point there is machines have always replaced humans, but now in terms of cognitive functions, but you see it everywhere. You drive to the airport, now it's electronic billboards, it's not some person putting it up, the kiosks, et cetera. But, you know, is you know you've you've used the term you know pave the cow path. We don't want to protect the, the the past from the future, right? So, to your point, right? Retraining, education. I mean, that's the opportunity here, isn't it? Yeah. And, and the the potential is enormous. Well, and you know, let's face it, we haven't had much in the way of productivity improvements in the U.S. or any other advanced economy lately. So we need some, yeah. I guess, you know replacement of humans by machines, but um, my argument has always been, you know, you can handle innovation better, you can um, avoid the sort of race to the bottom that automation sometimes leads to if you think creatively about humans and machines working um, as colleagues in many cases. Well, you remember in, in the PC boom, and, I, and I, I forget who the Fed chairman was, it might have been Greenspan said, you. You can see you know, progress everywhere except in the productivity oh, yeah, that, numbers. That was an MIT professor, Robert Solo. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, and then, who won uh, the Nobel Prize. And then, but yeah. then shortly thereafter, there was a yeah. huge productivity boom. So, I mean, is there <laughs> maybe a pent up? Yeah. Well, God knows. I mean, um, everybody's wondering. We've been spending literally trillions on IT, and you would think that it would have led to productivity, but, you know, <laughs> certain things like social media, I think, reduce productivity in the workplace and uh, you know we're all 
chatting and talking and slacking and so on all over the place, maybe that's just not conducive to getting work done. It depends what you're doing with that social media, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you're in our business, it's actually a good it's thing. It's phenomenal to see <laughs> political coverage these days, which is almost entirely consists of reprinting uh, politicians' tweets. Exactly, I guess it's made life easier for, <laughs> for them, although you, those poor people, reporters sitting in the White House waiting for a press conference, they're not doing very no, well. No, well, there aren't many reporters left, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, where do you see, in your consulting work, your, your academic work, where do you see AI being used most effectively in organizations right now? And where do you think that's going to be three years from now? Well, I mean, the, the general category of activity, of, of use case, is the sort of, I sometimes call it boring AI. It's um, Data integration, one thing that's being discussed a lot at this conference, mm -hmm. it's connecting your invoices to your contracts to see did we actually get the stuff that we you know, contracted for. It's um, uh, doing a little bit better job of identifying fraud and doing it faster. So all of those things are quite feasible, they're just not that exciting. What we're not seeing are curing cancer, creating fully autonomous vehicles, you know, the really aggressive moonshots that we've been trying for a while, just haven't succeeded at. What if we kind of expand, you know, AI as kind of the rubric for all this new cool stuff that's coming out. So, considering all these new techs, whether new techs, AI, blockchain, you know, new security approaches, when do you think that machines will be able to make better diagnoses than doctors? Well, I think, you know, in a very narrow sense, in some cases they can do it now, mm -hmm. but the thing is, um, first of all, uh, take a radiologist, which is one of the doctors, I think, most at risk from this, because they don't typically meet with patients and, and they spend a lot of time looking at images. Um, it turns out that the lab experiments that say, you know, these are better than human radiologists, the AI, tend to be very narrow, and what one lab does is different from another lab, so it just is going to take a very long time to make it into, you know, production deployment in the physician's office. We'll probably have to have some regulatory approval of it, so the, you know, the, the lab research is great, it's just getting it into day-to-day -day reality is the problem. Okay, so staying in this context of digital, you know, as a sort of a, a, an umbrella topic, do you think large retail stores will largely disappear? Uh, you know, some sectors more than others for uh, things that um, you don't need to touch and feel and so on before you order them, certainly. Even that obviously is happening more and more in, in online commerce. Um, what people are saying will disappear next is the, the human at the point of sale. And we've been talking about that for a while in in grocery, not so not achieved so much yet in the US. Amazon Go is a really interesting experiment where every time I, I go in there, I try to shoplift, but it seems to <laughs> be able to prevent me. Um, it took a while, now they have 12 stores, it's not huge yet, but um, I think if you're in one of those jobs that a substantial chunk of it is automatable, then you really want to start looking around thinking, what else can I do to add value to these machines? Do, do you think traditional banks will lose control of the payment system? Uh, no, I don't, because the fintechs that you see thus far keep getting bought by traditional banks. So um, my guess is that um, people will want that certainty um, and you know, the funny thing about blockchain, we, we say in principle it's more secure because it's you know, spread across a lot of different ledgers, but people keep hacking into Bitcoin, so it makes you wonder. I think blockchain is going to take longer than we, we thought as well. So, uh, you know, in my latest book, wh which is called The AI Advantage, I start out talking by, about Amara's Law, this guy Roy Amara, who was a futurist, um, not nearly as well known as Moore's Law, but it, it said, you know, for every new technology, we tend to overestimate its impact in the short run and underestimate, underestimate its impact in the long run. In the long run. Yeah. And so I think AI will end up doing great things, 
we may have sort of tuned it out by the time it actually happens. And they, oh yeah, we finally have autonomous vehicles. We've been talking about it for 50 years. All right, last one. So one of the Democratic candidates, of the, one of the 75 Democratic candidates last <laughs> night mentioned the chief manufacturing officer. Yeah, well, that. do you see that automation will actually swing the pendulum and bring back manufacturing to the U.S.? I think it could if we were really aggressive about um, using digital technologies in manufacturing, doing 3D um, uh, manufacturing, doing um, uh, digital twins of every device and so on, but we are not being as aggressive as we ought to be and manufacturing companies have been kind of slow and um, I think somewhat delinquent in embracing these things, so they're going to, I think, lose the ability to compete. We'd have to really go at it in a big way to bring it, bring it all back. Uh, just, we've got an election coming up. There was a lot of concern following the last election about the potential of AI, uh, chatbots, you know, Twitter chatbots, deep fakes, uh, technologies that that obscure or, or alter reality. Are you worried about what's coming in the next year in that uh, capacity? No, that could never happen, Paul. We, we could never <laughs> see anything like that. No. <laughs> Deep fakes, I'm quite worried about. We don't seem to, I know there's some organizations working on how we would certify you know, an image as being real, but we're not there yet. Yes. My guess is certainly by the time the election happens, we're going to have all sorts of political candidates saying things that they never really said uh, through deep fakes and image manipulation. Scary. What do you think about the call to break up big tech? What's your position on that? Um, I think that it's a self-inflicted wound. You know, we just saw, for example, that the automobile manufacturers decided to get together, even though the federal government isn't asking for better mileage, they said, we'll do it. We'll work with you in California and the states that are more advanced. If big tech had said, we're going to work together to develop standards of ethical behavior and privacy and data and so on, they could have prevented some of this. Unless they change their attitude really quickly, I've seen some of it, um, Salesforce people are talking about you know, the need for data standards, data protection standards. Unless they change quickly, I think they're going to get legislation imposed and maybe get broken up. It's going to, it would take a while, depends on the next administration, but um, they're not being smart about it. Mm. You look at, all, I'm sure you see a lot of demos of advanced uh, AI type technology. Over the last year, what has really impressed you? Um, I, you know, the, I think the biggest advances have clearly been in image recognition. I was looking the other day, at, the, the big problem with that is you need a lot of labeled data. It's one of the reasons why Google was able to identify cat photos on the internet is we had a lot of labeled cat images in the ImageNet open source database. Um, but the ability to start generating images to do synthetic label data, I think could really make a big difference in how rapidly image recognition works. What do you mean synthetic? I'm sorry, what do you mean synthetic? Where we labeled? would actually create, we wouldn't have to have somebody going around taking pictures of cats, we'd create a bunch of different cat photos, label them as cat photos, have variations in them. You know, unless we have a lot of variation in images, that's one of the reasons why we can't use autonomous vehicles yet, because images differ in the rain and the snow and so on. We're going to have to have synthetic snow, synthetic rain to identify those images so the, you know, the GPU chip still realizes that's a pedestrian walking across there, even though it's kind of fuzzed up. Right now, just a little bit of variation in the image can throw off the recognition altogether. All right, Tom, hey, thanks so much for coming to theCUBE. It's great to see you, we got to go. My pleasure, and, uh, thanks for having me. Always good to catch you, you're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back from MIT CDOIQ in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dave Vellante with Paul Gillen. You're watching theCUBE.